Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Let me give you a few points real quick because I think we have to understand that the purpose of Ignite is to remind the church that, that there is a Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. And if you don't know that, then you need to get in your Bible and start reading. It's not enough just to come listen to sermons. It's not enough to just go from, from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. You know what? The most important meeting is the one that you have with Jesus. There's nothing that Jesus can't give you himself. We come to the church to be equipped, to be challenged, to see what God wants to do in the city, in the nation, and then we go to work, right? That's what we do. But the Holy Spirit is is so important. It's so important that I'm going to give you a few bullet points. Bullet point number one, Jesus was conceived in the womb of Mary by the power of the what? Holy Spirit, Luke chapter 134 and 35. Number two, Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit for the what? For his public ministry. In other words, there's nothing that Jesus did that he did not do without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. There is no way that we're going to be able to do the ministry that God has called us to. Whether it's someone here singing on our worship team or preaching or you know what? Or you as a, as a minister, you don't have to be in full-time ministry to be a minister of God. If you're born again, if you claim to be a Christian, a child of God, you are a minister of God and you need the Holy Spirit to empower the gift that God's placed in you. And so if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, so do you. Number three, Jesus was led by and fought temptation by the Holy Spirit. Okay? He was tempted just like you and I are tempted. There's nothing that Jesus didn't experience that you don't you and I don't experience already, but he was also led and he fought the temptation by the Holy Spirit. Jesus taught in the power of the Spirit. Luke 4:14. 4, and Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit to heal. And so think just think this for a moment. The reason I want to start like this in this message is because I want you to see the importance of the Holy Spirit. If, 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 these, if these things that Jesus did were all back, brought back and backed up by the Holy Spirit when it came to healing, when it came to teaching, preaching, when it came to enduring uh, uh, troubles and challenges, then how much more do we need the Holy Spirit? I think that the problem we have is that Many of us believe in the Holy Spirit, but not many of us are led by the Holy Spirit. And so I, I really believe that, that, that what God is doing tonight is that he wants to restore the hope. And, and here's what Jesus said. Jesus said as he was leaving his disciples, he said to them, hey, listen, I'm not leaving you orphan-hearted. Everybody say orphan, orphan-hearted. In other words, he's saying, hey, listen, I'm not going to leave you as this orphan who is heartless and has, and has no help. I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit who is your hope of glory, right? The Holy Spirit who is your helper, the one who is going to assist you. When things look dead, he's going to resurrect them back to life. The same Holy Spirit that brought Jesus to life. He's the one. But isn't it amazing how we can be so saved we can be so saved that we forget that the Holy Spirit is the only one who could bring our dead place back to life. I mean, think about it. We, we know this. But do we trust this? Do we trust this? I believe that, Pastor. But do you trust that? And, and, and let me tell you, I am guilty as much as you're guilty. So don't worry about it. We're all in the same boat here. But I'm praying that tonight there's going to be some restoration. Right? And so everybody say, I'm not orphan hearted. And I'm going to prove to you how we are orphan hearted sometimes. <laughs> so Jesus said to his disciples, being you and me, he's like, I'm not leaving you an orphan heart. I'm leaving you a helper. Holy Spirit. I'm not leaving you hopeless. I'm leaving you filled with hope. Look at this. Proverbs 13, 12 says this. 
then we're going to pray tonight and sing some more and just allow the Spirit of God to bring revival in us. Proverbs 13, 12 says this. It says, hope deferred. Everybody say hope deferred. Makes the heart what? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a dream fulfilled or a hope fulfilled is a tree of life. For example, I want you to think about this for a second. You know, the disciples, they loved Jesus with all their heart. They didn't have a love issue just like many of us. And please stay with me. Many of us here, we, we love Jesus. It's not that we don't believe in Jesus, that we have an issue believing in him, trusting him sometimes. <laughs> but I think that God knows that we love him. I believe that Jesus knows that you love him. But just as the disciples loved Jesus, they found them, themselves in a place of hopelessness. I mean, you're talking about... You can't get any closer than the disciples who were following him in, during his time of ministry. And now they saw miracles, signs, and wonders. They, they talked to him. They sat with him. They ate with him. They lived with him. For three and a half years, they were with him every single week. And now they're at a place where they're not struggling whether or not they love Jesus. You see, the moment Jesus was taken from them and slain... They lost hope. Isn't that amazing? Even though Jesus kept telling them, here's what's going to happen. They're going to take me from you. They're going to accuse me. They're going to beat me. They're going to crucify me. But don't worry. Everybody say, don't worry. He said, but don't worry because on the third day I'm going to rise again you see it's not a matter of will I ever face any problems okay because you will all face problems Jesus was so realistic with his team that he said hey guys we're gonna have some problems guys <laughs> they're gonna take me away from you have you ever lost anything they're gonna take me away from you they're gonna crucify me have you ever had something in your life a family, a marriage, a career, a business, a friendship. Did something ever get crucified? Did something ever die? But here's where Jesus constantly, though he was being realistic that this is what's going to happen. However, he said, I'm going to rise again. So the disciples, they kept hearing him. Like the church, they keep hearing the word of God. But not necessarily really believing the fact that we're going to rise again. And so the disciples are now in this place where, where they love Jesus. How many here love Jesus? For real. Okay, I want you to say, woo, if you love Jesus. One, two, three. Woo! Nice. But how many still have hope in Jesus? Oh, uh -huh. ah. Did you notice it was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, it's, it's true. So check this out. So the disciples loved Jesus, but when, when he was slain, they lost hope. I'll prove it to you. Look at this. Luke chapter 24, verse 21 says this. But we had what? Okay, are you guys here tonight? Let's read this together. Ready? One, two, three. But we had hope. In other words, we thought we can hope in what he said, but we lost hope. <laughs> yeah, don't search. I'm telling it to you right here. Turn your phone off. But we had hope that he was the one who was going to re redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In other words, they're like, look, we heard what he said, but it's been three days and still nothing has happened. We had hope if only he was the one that he said he was. Isn't it amazing how quickly they forgot every blind eye that was open. Every deaf ear that was open. Every lame person that was strengthened in their bones to get back up. Every dead person that came. It's amazing how many things they forgot. They forgot all the great miracles of Jesus. And then they come to a place where when you see 
when, when, when you lose hope, when hope deferred happens, you're basically putting it to the side. It says it starts making your heart sick. You start getting sick. It, it's, it's, you start losing heart. You start losing hope. You, you really don't, you can't see the best in anything. And, and we begin to worry about everything. You know, worry is, is like a rocking chair, right? It's always in motion, but it never takes you anywhere. Isn't that true? And so here, it said, but it's, it's been like the third day. And, and you know what? And, and since all this took place, man, we thought he was the one. We thought he was going to bring us hope and redeem and, and do everything he said, but it's not happening. And, and I know that tonight, I bet there's people here that maybe feel that way. But I love this because he says, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. And I, I really believe that God wants to do something with, with hope in us tonight. Are you guys in for are you guys in for some faith tonight? Are you guys wanting to see some hope rise in us again? And so I know, I know that the issue is not that whether or not you love God. I really believe that that's not an issue here. Uh, I believe that what, what the issue is, is the hard experiences that you and I have had. You know what? The, the challenges, the, the stuff we've experienced, the circumstances, the pain, the aches, the betrayals. The, whatever it is that you've, you've gone, I think all those hard experiences have literally slain your expectation. When, when you've already experienced so much stuff that has literally got you to a place of like, man, it's never going to happen. It literally has slain the idea that my dream, that the hope that I once had is not going to happen. And so what what begins to take place is that there's a constant slaying of dreams and visions and things that God has shown you. And all of a sudden, there's no more expectation for anything. A hopeless person expects nothing good to come out of a situation. Have you ever heard people say something like this? Like, that always happens to me. But they love God. I've, I've, I've listened to good Christians in Elevate Church say that. Bad things always happen to me. See, because that's your expectation that bad things always happen to you. And so the disciples, it wasn't a question whether or not they love God. We know they love God. But you know what's pretty awesome? That the same disciples that were having this conversation amongst themselves saying, hey, listen, man. Man, I'm, dude. I mean, they're like talking to each other like, man, I, I really did hope. That it was Jesus that was going to do all the things he said. You know, he was going to, you know, it be the, the, the redeemer of Israel. And, and he said that he was going to do all these amazing. Man, I really. And so I bet you they were going back and forth with this conversation. Like, man, it just didn't happen. That sucks. But you know what's pretty cool? Is that Jesus allows you to have your little moment of misery. But what I love about Jesus is that his grace that's why in this song that we wrote, Awaken, that His grace is what brings us strength, right? In the midst of our stupidness sometimes, come on, anybody ever, anybody ever have a stupid moment? Anybody here? No? No one admits to that? Okay, God bless you. I have stupid moments. That grace covers my stupidity sometimes. You won't say it, but I'll say it, don't worry. And you know what happens in the story? The same disciples that said, we hoped, E.D., past tense, that he would redeem. The same disciples that said that, Jesus shows up to, to them on the road. And he says, what? What? <laughs> you were saying? And I believe what the Spirit of God is doing tonight is the same Jesus that approached those two disciples that said, we hope is the one that came on their road and said, no, you can hope again. You can hope again. Look at two or three people and say, you can't hope again. Listen, if you've allowed fear, bitterness, resentment, self-pity, blame into your own spirit, I want you to know tonight, please, that the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that's going to raise us up out of that resentment, out of that bitterness, out of that fear, 
out of whatever feelings you have on the inside, he's the only one who can resurrect that hopelessness and he can come in your road of pain and say, hey, I'm right here. You can hope again and he can bring that back to life, right? Look at this. I love this. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 12 says this. It says return. Everybody say return. No, say it like you mean it. Say return. Because that's what you have to prophesy tonight. You're going to have to prophesy tonight, return to yourself. You're going to prophesy to hope tonight, return. Those watching on live stream, you're going to have to prophesy. I don't care if you look goofy, talking to your computer, your TV, whatever it is, but you're going to have to speak, return, return. Now let's say it with some power. Ready? Are you ready? One, two, three. Yeah, I want you to shout it because there's something about speaking up. God wants to hear from the church. He, sa he says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And he was expecting some expectation from Ezekiel to say, yes, Lord, it can live. And so he says right here in Zechariah, another great prophet, he says, return to the stronghold. Ever say the stronghold? See, normally when we talk about strongholds, it's a very negative connotation when you say stronghold. Strongholds are normally bad things that hold on to you. You know, bitterness is a stronghold. Resentment is a stronghold. Anger is a stronghold. Fear is a stronghold. We, I can keep going. Let me keep going. There's a lot of strongholds. Lust is a stronghold. Pride is a stronghold. Have I called yours out yet or should I keep going? I heard one lady back there say, keep going. <laughs> but, but listen, but in this context, Zechariah is talking about a healthy, pure, holy stronghold. And he says, return to the stronghold. If you study the original uh, of, of this verse, uh, the word stronghold means strength. So really what Zechariah is saying is, Mauricio, I want you to return back to your strength. And so right now, maybe you, you've been weak because you've been hopeless because you've hoped that you would be further along. You, would, you hoped that your career would have been so much better. You hoped that you would have enough money to take care of your family, yourself. You hoped that my kids would have come to Christ by now. You've hoped that I should have been married by now. You've hoped you finished the sentence. I've hoped, I've hoped, I've hoped, but I've lost hope. But tonight, Zechariah the prophet is speaking and he's saying, you're going to need to begin to say, return to me, O strength. And you know what? Let me tell you something. Stop waiting for someone to bring you strength because he's the only one, the spirit of God within you can, he's the only one that can revive the strength. There, stop looking for some. No one can do that for you. Not your spouse, not your pastor, not your mom, not your dad, not your, not your kid. No one can bring you strength but God. Get that right now, Revelation. Because if not, you'll just be this pity person the rest of your life. Always expecting something from someone when someone owes you nothing. You're entitled to nothing. But you're entitled to God. Amen? And so Zechariah is saying, hey, Mauricio, return to your strength. You see, there's a form of strength that we've all had at one moment. And I really believe that the prophetic word tonight is we got to get back to our strength. Man, that place where we were so, oh, that nothing moved us. Remember that season in your life where you were just so connected with God, where you just felt like, Nothing was impossible and all things are possible with God. Maybe not with man, but with God. My God, he can do this. Uh, do you remember those? Do you remember that moment in your life? Some of you are like, I'm living there right now, Pastor. That's awesome. Thank you. Keep going. But some of us have lost that place. And so look, can I, can I finish? How many minutes am I, am I at already? You prisoners of hope. Ooh, look at that. You prisoners of hope. You pri look at your look at your really like, just say you prisoner of hope. I mean, 
It's like, it's like when, when, when Zechariah is saying, you're a prisoner of hope, that's a good thing. You know, uh, many of us, we're prisoners to a lot of crap. But Zechariah is talking about some good stuff. He says, man, you prisoner of hope, you. That's like being, you know, someone with ball and chain of hope, and you're just dragging hope everywhere you go. Like, there's not one situation, one circumstance that I go into that hope doesn't come with me. I mean, that's what Zechariah is saying. In whatever situation that you're in, he says, man, it's such a stronghold. It's so strong in you that you bring hope with you everywhere you go. What if we were to be that kind of church that we started bringing hope in whatever circumstance? No, seriously. Because Zechariah is saying that, that, that you prisoners of hope, he's basically saying, hey, remember, when you return back to the strength, when you return back to your former condition, when Jesus and you really connected and you had this strength in him and you didn't give a rip who said what and who did what and, and who talked about you, you didn't give a rip. But then all of a sudden you got so saved and so sanctified and all of a sudden now everything matters to you. Everything bothers you now. Now you got an opinion. Before, it was like, you know what, don't, man, love your enemies. Now it's like curse them. Beat them. Jump them. Yeah, some of you laugh because you know I'm talking to you. You know, you know who you are in here. Don't pretend. You prisoners of war. I mean, of, 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 of hope. How awesome is that? My God, I would love someone to say to me, Monique, man, you prisoner of war? That's, that's a good cuss. You know, that's like, yeah, tell me that. That means that I'm, I'm, I'm ball and chain. Everywhere I go, I have hope in every situation. <laughs> that's, like, that's like, Mauricio, you got some serious bondage, man. It's hope, dude. <laughs> You got the bondage of hope. Wouldn't that be a good bondage? Like, dang, you're so, you're so in bondage, man. Of hope. I like that. But let's finish it because if not, we'll never finish the sermon. Even today, everybody say even today. Even today. That I declare that I will restore double to you. You're either going to hope for this or not. I'm not, this is some, this is a, this is a message, this is a prophetic word tonight. You're either going to accept this or not, or you're just going to sit there and be like, okay, all right, it's good, Pastor. It's on fire tonight. No, this is Zechariah prophesying to us. This is Zechariah speaking. Do you know that the, the Bible is the, is the most, most confident word that you can stand on? It's, it's, it's the only prophetic word that you know can't miss it. A, a man who prophesies can miss it, but the Bible cannot miss it. This is the, the prophet Zechariah speaking to the church of 2017 saying to you tonight that I will return. Come on, strength is going to return. Whatever you have lost Whatever has been taken from you, I am going to restore double back to you. But you're going to have to awaken the hope within you. And that, that requires your cooperation. This does not happen on its own. God will always deliver on his promises, but God always needs a delivery person. Period. And I will restore double to you. And I will restore double to you. What if we just start saying, okay, God, you know what? I have lost stuff. I have lost time. I have lost finances. I've lost health for years. I've, I've lost joy. I've, I've lost hope. But God's saying, but I'm going to double it, Mauricio. But I'm going to double it, Virginia. But I'm going to double it, Candy. Man, hope will be restored. Man, you are going to be restored. Everything that the locust has eaten, I'm going to bring it back to you double. Because that is the faithfulness of God. He delivers. He is faithful to his promises. But we have to get that prophetic edge back in our life to where we say yes. Holy Spirit, yes. Some of us, man, we've been so, ah. It's... Wake up. 
<sighs> Wouldn't you like to be that kind of person that goes into every situation with hope? Hope is sexy. It's attractive, isn't it? You know what? Let me tell you something. I'll say it this way because I don't want to mess it up. Those with the most hope will always have the most influence. You know how I thought about this? I think about Joel Osteen. A lot of people make fun of Joel Osteen. It sucks. And they're like, he's not spirit-filled. He's not. It's like, shut up. Stupid, but he's changing the world. You goofball. What do you, if you've said anything wrong about Joel Osteen, zip it. Because I'll, I'll come back and say, but what are you doing? What are, what are you doing? How many lives have you changed? Because <laughs> this man's changing the world. I don't care if he's spirit filled. I don't, it doesn't matter. You're so opinionated. Get over yourself. You're so saved. The so saved people always have something to say about other people. They do. You know why? I won't say it. I won't say it. I'll get in trouble. I won't say it. I won't say it. I know why. I know why. Oh, I know why. Oh, I know why. But I'm not going to say why. It's okay. It's okay. Because then we're going to, the Spirit's going to leave us and that's not going to be good. So, so, those with the most hope have the most influence. Always have the most influence. You know what? Everything that comes out of Joel Osteen is hope. It's like the brother can't have a bad day. He's always smiling about everything and today... The Lord is, I mean, I love that, but you know why? Because the man is a man, wherever he goes, his stronghold is hope. I respect that guy. But let me tell you something. Do you want to know why people that, that, that have hope are mostly the greatest influencers? Because the ache of the world's heart the world is aching in their heart the world is aching in their heart hope deferred makes the heart what so the world is aching for hope and hope is transferable into every single business church community politics it's, it's so powerful that Jesus was able to change the entire world through hope. So the ones with the most hope are the ones with the most influence in life. Because you are someone that always brings hope in any circumstance. Doctor said they're going to die. Oh, that's not what my God says. My God says he will live and not die and declare the good works of the Lord. The only reason we don't bring that kind of hope is because we really don't have that kind of hope. Let me explain this. But pastor, there's already hope. Let me give you the definitions of, of hope. The world's hope, the society's definition of hope. Okay, the culture of this world's hope is this. The world's culture or society's definition of hope is this. Is this something you wish for. It's like, I hope I get a raise. I hope my car starts today. I hope, I hope, I hope we don't have to work late tonight. See, that's, that's wishful hope. And, and listen, and most people operate on that kind of hope. I hope I get to go to Cancun this year. What's that demonic thing that everybody goes to? Coachella? <laughs> it's funny. I see all throughout Facebook, Christians going to Coachella. I'm like, God bless you, man. I won't go there. Okay. <laughs> Something you wish for. That's the world's hope. Because people say, well, why do I need God? Why do I need the church? I, I have hope. Yeah, you got you got society's hope. But the biblical hope that God talks about, let me give you a definition of that one. The biblical definition of hope is this. It's the joyful anticipation of something good. 
In other words, man, I carry, I have the stronghold of hope and every situation I come, I come into, I have a joyful anticipation that it's all going to be good. And in other words, you come and you show up, hey, listen, don't worry. Listen, I know the situation does not look good right now. I know we can't pay the bills right now. I know it just seems like we're not moving up. I know that we're not progressing. But let me tell you something. But we have a God that we can hope in. He said that he is faithful to all his promises. He is not a man that he should lie. And so if we start having that kind of hope, a biblical hope, then you begin to develop this amazing, awesome, authentic Come on, for all you millennials, authentic faith, that you begin to say, wait a minute. I know my circumstances not look good, but Zechariah said, wait a minute. Mauricio, you got a stronghold, man. Dude, you are a prisoner of hope. And I'm going to bring this ball and chain of hope everywhere I go. I keep doing this. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know why. I, I'm picturing a ball and chain. That's why. The ball's heavy, so I'm like, I'm going to lift my leg. I'm very imaginative, as you can see. Do you guys get the difference? <laughs> Let me give you one verse, and that's it. I'm going to close. Still early. Good. Just so you guys know, Ignite is the only service that we do once a month where we go like this teaching. And, um, and then we do worship in our services from 7 to 9 p.m. Why is it till 9 p.m., Pastor? Because, <laughs> because we want to get in this place where we give the Holy Spirit permission to do anything He wants. And we just, we're so always so scheduled here in this church. We start on time, we finish, and we're out. Not on Ignite. Ignite, yes, we go till 9. Why? Because we're, we're just preparing our hearts for something supernatural. Last verse quickly. Acts 20, verse 7 through 12 says this. And on the first day of the week, this, is, this really helps us ministers. We gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. And Paul was preaching to them. And since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. What if I started preaching and spoke to y'all till midnight? Some of you probably just would be rude and get up and leave, huh? Like, we got to go to work, Pastor. Well, look what happened. Look what will happen to you. And then the upstairs room, look at this. The upstairs room where we met was lighted with many flickering lamps. So shiki, huh? As Paul spoke on and on, and he spoke on and on, a young man, come on, a millennial name, <laughs> um, I think it's Eutychus. Yeah, it's Eutychus. Sitting on a windowsill, became very drowsy. Anybody drowsy right now? Finally, he fell sound asleep and he dropped three stories to his death below. I mean, the brother and the sister could not stay awake in the church service. Notice that the scripture says that the young man fell to his what? Church, please help me. Come on. The man fell to his what? Yeah. The man fell to his what? Yeah. The man what? Yeah. He what? Yeah. No, he fell. <laughs> Stay with me. It's, it's right there. It's an open book test. You have the answers. Good Lord Jesus. What's wrong with you guys? God is so good. He gives us an open book test and we always fail it, right? So he fell to his what? He what? To his what? He what? To his what? Okay, so he fell to his what? He what? To his what? He what? To his what? Okay, get that. right good why are you doing that to keep you awake I don't want you to fall to your death he fell sound asleep and he dropped three stories three stories that's like three that three elevate churches stacked up and the brother is sitting on the windowsill like 
dazing off. Paul's talking about the resurrection and the Holy Spirit. And boom. I'm going to go somewhere there. Don't let me forget the word fell and death. Don't let me forget. If you let me forget, then we miss the whole purpose of this scripture. Verse 10. And then Paul went down and he bent over him and he took him into his what? And he took him into his arms. So he's laying dead and just took him into his arms. Someone get a picture of this. This is going to go on social media. And, and he, he took him into his arms. I mean, I mean, the brother fell asleep and he fell. It's his fault. But Paul runs down and he, he sees him on the floor because he fell and he goes down and he grabs him and he lifts him up in his arms and, and obviously we know that the description of lifting up, up lifting him in his arms he's obviously holding him in this amazing love and, and obviously he must be whispering something you know the, the man is dead and he had to have been whispering but the people are freaking out the people are just saying oh my god this is tragic this is horrible how can this be and as he's holding this man in his arms. He sees that the people are a little freaked out, but he gets up and he shouts, what? Don't worry. Paul had the Zechariah revelation that hope was his prison. He knew that the man was dead, yet he's able to look at the audience, at the group of people and say, don't worry. What if the next time you face a situation, the first words out of your mouth is, don't worry. My God is going to take care of this. That's, what, that's the kind of hope I'm trying to bring revival to tonight. Don't worry. Don't, don't trip. Don't trip. And he says, don't worry. He said... He's alive. No, he's dead. No, he's alive. No, he's dead. He's alive. Hope always see things through a whole other perspective. What, what, see, biblical hope sees the circumstance that says it's not going to happen. But there's something about that spiritual prisoner of hope that goes against the odds and it doesn't matter what it looks like because heavenly hope says I see what I see but I know that though it's dead I know there's something that's going to come to life in this situation that's being a prisoner of war of hope yeah, yeah the worst circumstance you're like I, I know I know it's dead but it's alive and Paul had this he was this prisoner of hope and he's saying hey listen don't 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 trip Hey, don't worry. He's not dead. He's alive. He, he, he immediately brings hope to the people. And it says, and then they all went back upstairs. Oh, look, that's, that's influence. The moment he, he, the brother didn't even come back to life yet. He just said, don't worry. He's, he's alive. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and they all went back upstairs like nothing happened. What is God saying? He's saying, okay, first of all, when you face a circumstance, stop worrying because worrying is like a rocking chair. You know what? It's always in motion, but it's taking you nowhere. So you might as well just be the prisoner of hope and just say, okay, Mauricio, this is the circumstance, but don't worry. It's going to come back to life. It's going to be good. And then go back upstairs and do your life. Just keep living. Keep going. Put your hope in Christ and keep going. Like what if I just tried that for once, for real? Like what if, what would happen, kind of like I've been preaching the last few weekends, what if you truly follow Jesus Christ with all of your life, your health, your heart, your mind, your finances, your family, your children, what if you follow Jesus Christ every single day? I wonder what kind of person you'd become. I wonder, I wonder what calling you would discover and probably realize that the thing you're doing now for a living was never what God called you to do. 
you don't have to be in the ministry. But there's a ministry out there called the marketplace that God has called you to. But too many times we learn to cope with our hopelessness and we learn to live and coexist with it and then we just settle. Is this okay? Worship team, come on up already. Let's get out of here. Let's keep talking as the worship team is coming up. They're not asleep, are they? Can we thank our worship team for always working hard? You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Stand to your feet so you know I'm finishing, because if not, I won't finish. How many were encouraged tonight? Okay, good. Let's finish this then, and then let's, let's worship. We're done at 9, so don't worry. Let's just wait on the Holy Spirit. Because you're going to prophesy and your hope was going to be restored tonight. My hope is going to be restored tonight. The Spirit of God is in this place. He's alive. He's alive. Then they all went back upstairs just like we all went back to worship. <laughs> Look at this. And they all went back to worship. In the Lord's Supper, and that's what we're doing right now. We're here at, this, at the Lord's table right now at church. And they all ate together. We're all going to eat on God's faithfulness tonight. We're going to just, he's going to fill us tonight. If you're empty, he's going to fill you. And then Paul continued talking to them until dawn. And Mauricio kept preaching until the next morning. And then he left. <laughs> Meanwhile, the young man that died was taken home alive and well. And meanwhile, as Elevate Church service concluded, and you went home alive, awakened, and well. Because your hope was restored. And God is giving you double. How do I receive that? Start being a delivery boy. Because the Father is faithful to deliver his promise. But he needs a delivery boy, he needs a delivery girl to carry it through. If today's message impacted you in any way and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.